Welcome. Live and unscripted with Susan Schmidt. Hello and welcome, Quilty friends. I am Susan Smith. You are in my studio, Stitched by Susan, and I have got a super fun project this morning. It's kind of a cross between edge to edge and custom quilting. It does not have blocks. It's a whole cloth quilt, but I would say it probably falls more toward custom quilting. There'll be a bit of ruler work involved, and there's going to be a couple fairly mind-blowing tools tool tips that I'm going to give you, unexpected tools that you're going to love, I think. So, so glad you're joining me for today's Live and Unscripted. These Live and Unscripted episodes air the first and third Friday of every month. Most often they feature a edge-to-edge -edge type project, so same design over a whole quilt top, and usually right from beginning to end of that project. And my intention is just to invite you into my studio to kind of look over my shoulder and watch as I'm turning out a quilt. I don't profess to know the right way to do everything or even know how to do all the things, but I just welcome you to come and again, look over my shoulder as I'm working and see how I do things. And I think that might be helpful for you. I can still so vividly remember my early years working on the long arm and you know, you'd get a quilt loaded or even get ready to load it. And there would just be so many questions about thread choices or load it sideways or right side up or all the things. And I remember all those questions. So hopefully just watching me do things just helps to answer a bunch of them. These are not classes per se. I'm just inviting you virtually into my studio. So I am so glad that you are here today. If you enjoy these episodes, I invite you to like and to subscribe and also to share with any of your quilty friends that you think would benefit. I do work on a long arm machine. Some of the tips and tools that I share would really be helpful on a domestic as well. And certainly some of the design ideas that I use um, would translate well into domestic, you know, machine quilting as well. But I do work on a long arm in all of these episodes. So huge credits go to my husband, Dave, who is behind the camera and all the wires and cables and things and makes this all happen. Sure appreciate it. And also uh, enormous thanks to our friend Dan, whose guitar music you are hearing in the background. We sure appreciate that. I am happy to answer your questions as we go. Um, generally, I pause between passes of the quilting to read your questions and talk about them a little bit. If you would put the letter Q and a colon before them, then if there's a lot of comments, we're able to just search for those questions and find them easily when it's pause time for them. So that would really be helpful for us. Um, what else shall I say today? Hmm. I'm just reading down my little list, you guys. If you see my eyes kind of rolling in my head. A um, couple little things. You see me with my copy, coffee cup in hand. That's kind of my morning ritual. And YouTube shows always are free. But if you're interested in supporting what we do, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. And there for as little as $5. You can either make a one-time contribution or you can choose a monthly membership. And all of those funds go toward, you know, improving our cameras and our wiring um, lots of the things you can't see. And one of these days I need to do a behind the scenes show and show you the frame that Dave has built around the ceiling that our cameras hang from and all the things. So we're always trying to make as good a production as we possibly can to show you these quilting techniques. So buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. We really, really appreciate your support. I'm going to have one last sip and we're going to get started. Okay. Glasses on. I'm going to start loading. There's a few more things I want to tell you about that I offer, but I'll kind of talk as I'm going. So let's get started loading to begin with. Someone already mentioned the name of this gorgeous backing fabric, but I did want to show you guys. Look at that. It is absolutely stunning. And it is a design by Robin Pickens, and it's called Painted Meadow. It's by Moda. So this is going to be my backing. Um, Today's quilting is going to be a little more involved than what I sometimes do. So I don't know how much talking I'll be able to do while I'm quilting. And also it may take a little longer than we sometimes spend on these shows. And so I'm just gonna get right at it for loading and I may not do as much talking all the way through. I may have to stay focused on my quilting. So I'm using the red snapper system. And if you want more details on how I do this, um, just check out some of my other YouTube episodes. Some of them I go through it in much more detail as to how I'm loading. And 
points of caution and those sorts of things. But today we're just going to get it on and get going. You will be able to see how quick this is, and that's why I love it so much. Maybe you guys saw my finger violently pointing. I just needed my spritzer bottle. Just like that, the backing is loaded. And batting, today I'm using Hobbs 8020, my all time favorite batting. It's 80% cotton, 20% poly. And if it looks a little wrinkly and rough, it's because this is actually the end of a roll. And I had it laying overnight. I unrolled it last night because often the end of a roll has a lot of creases in it. And so I just had it laying overnight and spritzed it very lightly with water and let those creases just relax a little bit. And my quilt top. So you'll be able to really see what I'm doing today because I'm working on a solid top, which I don't do very often, quite honestly. And the reason I loaded my quilt top to bottom like this is because I'm working with the full width of fabric for both of the fabrics, both the backing and the top. So they're almost exactly the same width. I'm not going to quilt quite to the edge of the top. I could have trimmed it down, but I opted to just baste it where I want the edge of my quilt to be. But I, I just wanted to be able to grasp it at the sides to put my tension on it. And I couldn't load it this the other way partly because of not having excess backing and also because as you'll see my design is directional so I wanted it to be right side up. So there it is laying on top. Those of you who watch regularly know I have a black cat that I call the studio supervisor and boy there's a few little black hairs hanging around on my quilt top so sticky rollers just the ticket. There we go. It's not too bad. I try to keep him off my quilting things, but of course there's just dander in the air when you have a pet. All right, I'm going to show you the first magical tool. Ta-da! Which camera am I on? This one. For those of you who have sewed garments in the past, you will recognize this tool. It's a tracing wheel, but I looked specifically for the kind that is not um, scalloped. It's just a smooth wheel. And I'm sure I got this tip originally from another quilter. I know Susie Quilter uses it a lot. She uses a Hera marker, which is kind of like a plastic knife to mark on quilt tops. And I thought a wheel would work equally well. And when I'm doing long straight lines, it will go faster. So I don't know how well this shows on camera, but I have pre-marked a few things on this quilt. I've got vertical lines running from the top to the bottom, and I've divided the top into six equal spaces. We're going to be quilting a chevron type design between those lines, so I wanted to be able to see those lines all the time as I'm working my way down. And then all that's left to mark is my chevron angles, but the points will all line up. Does that make sense? So how I did it was I have a table with my cutting mat on it and I put one layer of batting on top of that and then my fabric. And then along my ruler, I just rolled with this little tool and it just makes a very fine crease. And that crease, unlike an air erase marker, does not disappear until moisture, you know, 
comes in contact with it. So I did that a couple of days ago and now my quilt top has just been laying ready for me, but those creases are all still here. And again, I don't know how visible they are on camera, but for me working on the quilt, it's just enough of a guideline that I'll be able to keep all those chevrons lined up beautifully from top to bottom. So this is a genius little tool. The key is to have that one layer of batting or something just a little bit soft under it or several layers of fabric would probably work too. Um, but just that, that little crease that is formed as you roll the wheel is absolutely genius. So there's no residue from a marker. The marker doesn't disappear. You have to work, don't have to worry about that. It's just the nice little crease. Okay, so that is magic tool number one. Now we're gonna go ahead and baste it. And again, I can see my vertical lines here, so I know where this outer edge is based on that vertical line. I just one second, folks. I'm feeling just a little bit of resistance here. My belt is not still on there, is it, Dave? Nope, it's not. This is live and unscripted, right? It's just feeling very heavy, and that's unusual. I was quilting with my um, my digital Elevate system this week, which involves attaching the belts. And I'm just making sure that I've got them fully detached. Hmm. This one is still attached to you. No, it's not. This one is still attached. I'm watching. Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. Sorry, folks. <laughs> It's really interesting, actually, after you've quilted for a while, you really get to know the feel of your specific machine. And just a little bit of roughness or hesitation, you just feel immediately. Okay, let's put our basting stitch in. I've got my vertical channel lock on, so I know I'm stitching a straight line, so I'm just adjusting my fabric so that that crease is falling right under the stitching line. Perfect. This quilt, by the way, um, I think I mentioned in some of my posts, maybe on Facebook, it's um, at my son's request, and it's for a friend of his who's having a baby shortly. Um, and he asked me to make a quilt. And I thought and thought about it because those of you who are quilt makers know, you know, not everyone loves or particularly appreciates the effort that goes into a handmade quilt. And it's not that I didn't want to put the effort in, but I thought, you know, how can I make something really beautiful and not put a ton of time into it? I don't have oodles of time for piecing quilts these days. Anyway, this was kind of what I thought was a fairly genius answer, was to just quilt something, put a beautiful backing, a solid color top, and quilt something pretty. So that's what we're doing today. And yes, I'm giving up my gorgeous Robin Pickens fabric for this. Okay, our quilt is basted. Now I'm going to put my, um, my grabbers on the edges. I'm just wondering if I have to trim this batting out of here. I think it'll be okay. We'll soon know when we start quilting, that's for sure. Yep, that's not gonna work. Okay, hang on a sec. Dave, would you mind handing me scissors out of that second drawer? Okay, this is gonna take just a moment, folks. I'm going to trim up my batting. So I've got my top floating down on the front edge of my quilt, uh, a quilting frame, and so I can see the edge of the batting. I'm gonna trim the excess off and I'm gonna trim the sides just a little bit so I have less excess hanging around. I may actually, I'm thinking things through. I know you can't see my brain turning see the wheels turning maybe you can see the smoke rising I'm just thinking through do I actually have to put tension on the sides could I get away without doing that and my conclusion is I probably can't because I'm going to be quilting across this with a ruler and that tends to want to push the fabric ahead of the hopper foot a little bit I just know that by experience so it's going to be wiser 
to take the time to get this excess batting out and go ahead and put side clamps on the side. Sometimes it's just worth spending the minute. So I'm just taking off the little extra bits of batting, tossing them on the floor for the moment. We'll clean up after the show so that I can better see this backing to get it in my grippers. These grippers too are part of the red snapper system. And it's particularly difficult today because I'm working with all these things that are the same width. Usually the backing extends much wider and this is much easier. And I'm trying something kind of new for you guys. Um, in the show notes that are below this episode on YouTube, I have put links to a lot of my favorite um, tools and things that I use. And so if there are some that I have missed in there, I'd love if you would tell me and I'll add them and then I'll just carry them forward from show to show so that you can always find them there. And as I'm thinking it over, I was just working on this this week. I don't think that I have the red snappers in there yet, so I will put them in. But some of my favorite tools are in there. And that way, if you can't find them locally, that gives you a resource where you can locate them. Oh, I should have kept my pin in my hand. There we go. Hmm. I don't know if I can clip this side. It's so narrow, folks. I'm going to have to do it without that side clipped, at least for this first pass. Okay. Let's get on to business, though. We're going to put our magnetic bars on the front. So once I've done this, as you can see, I've got all four sides of my quilting area stable. I've basted up the left, across the top, down the right, magnets on the front, and now nothing is able to shift, except I see that I pushed the fabric a bit crooked. Hang on a sec. Adjustment. I find it so key when I'm quilting to kind of always be looking at the big picture, if that makes sense. I had, you know, smoothed with my hands and the fabric was just pushed a little bit toward this basting and I could see that. And so just that process of looking showed that to me. I was able to adjust and now everything looks smooth and straight. If it's a piece top, I often do that, you know, with the seam lines this way, seam lines vertically, just visually checking all the time while I'm working. Alrighty, let's get on to quilting. This project is, as I mentioned earlier, more complex than a lot of the ones that I do on these live and unscripted shows. So I think for today's purposes, I'm going to just work fairly quietly because I got to pay attention. And every so often I'll stop and take questions and chat a bit about what I'm doing or decisions that I made. So because it is a solid fabric, I think you'll be able to see clearly what I'm doing and hopefully that will help you glean what information you want to know. But I just really have to pay attention and I probably won't be as talkative as I sometimes am. I know you guys can hardly believe that's possible, but it is. And I'm definitely using my vertical lines that I'm able to see on the quilt top. I don't know that you can see them, but I'm using them to establish where my points are and as reference points to keep my ruler vertical lines straight too, to keep everything on the level. There is going to be a fair bit of marking involved in this project. I will show you my other magic tool before I stop chattering. I'm using one of my favorite rulers because I'm going to be quilting um, a lot of straight lines. But what you can see, can we do the close-up camera for a sec, Dave? There we go. You can see in there my, my little, 
like so. There we go. Oh, no, too close. <laughs> there we go. You can see the black dots on here. So those are actually a Sharpie marker. And the reason I do that is so that I don't have to rethink or redo the addition in my head. You'll see as I'm quilting, there's repeating lines with this spacing that it would be all too easy to mess up basically when I'm not thinking too clearly about it. So I've just pre-decided on my spacing and marked it on my ruler with a Sharpie, which I know seems like craziness, but it comes off really easily with a little alcohol swab. And so I do this often. I do it too if I've got really awkward measurements like dividing a five inch space into three, for example, figure it out once, drop the marks in, and then you can use them over and over again. So for today's purposes, I can just lay the ruler on my quilt and drop a dot in at every one of those marks. And that's where my lines will be, my next set of lines that I'm going to draw. Except my ruler won't fit in there well. There we go. So this is probably a good time for you guys to be working on a project in your studio or doing some cooking because this is going to be a little bit like watching paint dry. But oh, when the quilting starts. I first quilted a design similar to this um, years ago. I could not find a picture of it. It's, it was probably in the first year that I was long arming. And um, so I'm just kind of recreating it as best I can remember it. It's not difficult quilting, but the result is spectacular. Oh, I put those lines on there incorrectly. Hang on a sec. Did I mention I shouldn't be talking while I'm working? <laughs> I'm not a very good multitasker, I'll be honest with you. I hope Mr. Producer has put on some really nice music for you guys. I haven't yet. I'm going to make another quilt, but I will soon. You might want to do that, Dave, because this is, like I said, a bit like watching paint dry. And it's going to take a couple of minutes. I think I'll get two sets of chevrons marked before I start quilting. Is that better? And I'll be honest with you, I do have these kind of preset markings on my uh, ruler, but I'm not being horribly, horribly finicky. Like I could be marking in multiple locations those dots to make sure that these lines are precisely spaced. I don't think in the scheme of things that will show. I'm just using my visual cues. Like there are lines in my ruler, right? So I'm watching the lines I've already marked to try and keep things parallel but I'm not sweating too hard over it. And I see I got one line, a boo-boo already, so I'm gonna show you guys one more tool that I know you will love if you do any ruler work or marking with these types of pens. We'll get to that in just a moment.
So Line, can you see this? I've got a pink pen in my hand that So Line makes. That's the brand. And it's got this little felt tip on it and a tiny water canister. So the cool thing about it is when you're marking something as I am now and you've made a mistake and want to erase it, squeezed a little too much water, um, you can just put a tiny bead of water in the area where you want to erase. It's not even a bead, it's less than that. Um, so that it doesn't, you don't have to spritz and make your whole quilt top wet. It's finer even than a Q-tip, although a Q-tip would work similarly. When you get a line in the wrong place, it's an easy correction. But you can see why I do need to pay attention to um, the spacing of my lines. Have I got that one right? I do. Maybe this wasn't the best one to do on camera. <laughs> you guys might get a good chuckle out of me before the day is over. No, see, that's the one I don't want, Susan. Wake up. Okay, I got it now. And then a quarter inch, and these may not stick because it's damp there. I may have to remark them as I get quilting. We'll see how that goes. Okay, there's one chevron. Um, let's cover up my water pen, cover up my marker. Okay, Dave is saying there are some more questions. I will put in dots while we have some questions, or maybe I'll just watch the screen. My glasses glare so much. Sorry about that. Okay, let's do a few questions. Jody, I'm so glad you show your entire process of loading and marking. Thank you. You know, I, I didn't know if this would be just deadly dull to watch me marking or if it would be of interest and help to some of you to see that I make mistakes too, if nothing else. Joey, what was your thread choice for this quilt? It's, it's a matching thread, Joey. Same color of thread. And question, a newbie here, what kind of pen are you using? This is a, um, an air erasable pen. So it will disappear in a little bit of time. This is not the marker you would want to use if you're not going to quilt it till tomorrow. Sandal, I can't easily get behind my long arm, so I wonder if I could use the red snapper system. Uh, well, that is a question, except doesn't your machine go out far? to the one side and you have to walk on the other, it seems to me that you would be able to, but I don't know your exact situation. Jane, are the red snappers difficult on your hands? I have arthritis, so I wonder if this is a challenge. I pin now. I have to say, Jane, that would be a consideration. It does take some hand strength. You can alleviate it a bit by warming them or softening them with a blow dryer or laying them in a tub of hot water before you put them on. That can make it 50% easier in a hurry, but that is a thought. Deborah, do you feel hops batting has a right and wrong side when you sandwich on the long arm? I honestly don't. It's not as distinct which is which, like Warm and Natural brand, for example, is. I use it every which way, being perfectly honest. Maureen, did you make a paper design first to follow or just using the markings on your quilt? Great question, Maureen. And then there's one that follows it. Julianne, do you normally draw your design on paper before quilting or you already have it all in your mind and it going straight to the quilt? Let's talk about that for a sec. I just want to make sure my marks are staying long enough for me. They are. Okay. You guys will love this. You know, because I've talked about them before, about my plexiglass sheets. So this is eighth inch thick plexiglass. And what we've done, we purchased this at the hardware store. They pre-cut it to these sizes. Mine are 18 by 24. But whatever fits comfortably sort of on the table of your long arm. Am I in the middle? Yes, I am. Um, I've just got duct tape on the edges so that it's got like a rim so I can't easily draw off it. So yes, I sat and drew out my design. You guys can kind of see it. Different camera. There we go. So you can see it a little bit. And what I was doing was figuring out which things I want to put in which order and also thinking about the scale. So this was the first one I drew. I think that's right. Nope, this is the first one. It doesn't matter, I can show you them both. All that's different, they're the same feather and various stripes. It's really hard to see, I know that it is. So we, we'll just look at the one that is on the quilt then. This one I've got a five and a half inch feather border. On the first one I had a four inch. So either one would work. The reasons I changed is because this is a baby quilt and I don't wanna spend 20 hours quilting it, right? So. The same amount of quilting, pretty much, in this chevron will give me two or three more inches of quilt finished. 
as opposed to doing more and smaller scale. That makes sense? So that was kind of my thinking for for scale. And, and on the other side, it was weighed by, I don't want huge sprawling feathers. And so I didn't want to go big endlessly. I thought this was a happy medium. That's just a matter of personal opinion. That's how I chose it. And I'm keeping this actually standing up against the wall behind me so that I can refer to it to make sure I get the right things quilted in the right stripes. It looks really complicated on here, but actually there's just a feather and then there's a ripple, a solid and a ripple. It's not too complicated really once I get quilting. So I think what I'm gonna do guys is go ahead and quilt this one so that you guys can see it. And then we, you can take a coffee break while I mark the next one. How does that sound? <laughs> There's another question. Jane, could you draw these lines for your elevate to sew across? I suppose that's a possibility, Jane, but I wouldn't have the faintest clue how to do it. I hardly ever use my elevate. I don't use the design program at all. So if someone of you knows how to do that and wants to go for it, be my guest. So I'm just gonna take the magnets off and roll this back a little bit toward me so that I'm not quilting fully at arm's length. And I'm limited because I've already got my stretcher on that side. And I am at this moment leaving my right side unstretched because it's so tight. I have a bit of a workaround for that, which I'll show you as I go. I do need the ruler base today because I will be quilting with the ruler. Most long arms have this additional table that you can snap on. And it's so that you have a small, basically table to rest your ruler upon. It is critical for ruler work to have a table like this. So I'm gonna quilt, quilt run line. Whew, the tongue is still tangled. I'm going to quilt one line across and make sure that it works smoothly without that right side being clamped. And then away we go. We're just double checking the lighting here. What's the trouble? Seems okay now. All right. I don't wanna keep making excuses, but yeah, this is indeed live and unscripted. So you get to see us. This is how it really happens sometimes. Hmm. Again, I've made life quite difficult for myself by making the design go so close to the edge of the fabric. The truth is when I'm doing ruler work, I usually try to be much more generous with my backing because it enables you to lay your ruler down in any direction more easily. Do you see how I'm bumping up against my edging? Um, this is how it's comfortable for me to hold my ruler, but I had to start by doing it kind of awkwardly. And it just feels like you're stitching left-handed. It's not the end of the world, but it is certainly easier if you have more generous backing. Okay, talking, talking, checking, one, two, three. 
Okay. A few more gremlins still. Did you see what I did there, though? Now that I have quilted, you know, gotten launched on this line across the quilt, I went ahead and put my one clamp on so that I can now push kind of against it and it's not pulling my quilt funny. For those of you who are new, bless you for being patient and sticking with us. Sometimes it goes smooth as anything. My ruler is just barely long enough to quilt these lines without repositioning in the middle. Someone, I think Joey asked earlier which thread I was using. Um, the brand is Isocord, it's 100% poly, a 40 weight thread, and it is in the same color as the fabric, just a very soft pink.
I'm going to try this one on constant speed. You guys will see the difference that makes in just a second. Let's just see how that works. I'm going to slow it down a little bit from my typical till I get a feel for it. This is how I try things out. I definitely prefer the feel of this. It's definitely smoother to work in the constant speed instead of the zoom zoom of the motor. There we are. So you're seeing one handy stripe. After that focused quilting across there, it's time for a sip of coffee and a couple of your questions. And we'll get the next stripe marked for the feather. How's it looking? Perfect, okay, I'll stand back with my coffee. Let's not slosh it on the pale pink quilt. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Oh, they're coming. Jody, how do you decide what stitch length when using ruler? My personal favorite is in about the 13 range. I generally don't go smaller than that unless I'm doing something teeny tiny like pebbles and then I go a little smaller. So that's my personal comfort zone. Joey, once you get your chevron straight lines quilted, will you fill between the lines? Yeah, yeah. You'll see as I go, Joey. There's more detail coming yet. 
Paula is asking, what is your diamond shaped ruler? It is by Creative Grids and the designer of it specifically is Krista Moser, one of my heroes. Krista publishes a lot of quilt patterns. I encourage you to check her out. Um, Krista, K-R-I-S-T-A and Moser, M-O-S-E-R. All of her patterns have that 60 degree angle in it. And I chose it, and that was a great question by the way. I chose it because I thought a 45 degree angle would make too sharp of chevrons. So I've got a little more shallow chevrons with the, with the um, 60 degree angle of that ruler. Um, Jane is asking links where to get them. So that, could the list, gosh, I cannot talk this morning. I'm so sorry. Can links to where to get the items in the list be added? Um, in the show notes right below where you're watching this in YouTube, I have put some links. I will go back and add some more after the show today. So check back on that and I'll try to publish them with every YouTube episode so that you can just go there for links to the things that I use commonly. Teresa, your suggestion to spritz water to remove wrinkles in the backing worked wonderfully. I had never spritzed an entire back before. What a time saver as compared to ironing. Absolutely. I mean, one tiny caution is making sure that your fabric is color fast. That is so rare that that's a problem. So yeah, spritz is genius. Jane, the quality of your production compared to other videos far outweighs any hitches in the process. Thank you for your kind words, Jane, because I do wonder days like today when we have so very many wrinkles in the process. Um, thank you all for being patient. I appreciate it. Okay. Is that it? That's it. A little coffee for Susan. Now we're going to do the really fun part. We're going to do um, the feather. And while I mark the line for that, there's a few other places that you can find me if you're interested in what I teach in my style of quilting. So I've mentioned that these live and unscripted shows are the first and third Friday of every month. I've just got to count here in my head for a sec. Um, I also have a podcast and it's called Measure Twice cut once and other life lessons learned from quilters and that podcast comes out an episode every Wednesday morning and they're interview based with other quilters and their stories Moser. and actually Krista Moser whose ruler I mentioned was one of my very first guests so you can find her on the podcast her patterns are really remarkable they're unusual she is a gifted um, seamstress. She's very knowledgeable and has good tips and tutorials and things like that. Yeah, can't say enough good about Krista. And you might notice I've left the little triangles at the top unquilted. I did mark a line in there, which I realized in, in the thinking while I was doing some of the quilting shouldn't be there because the next thing in my repeating pattern is this wide feather border. So that little three stripe bit that I just did is one component and the feather is the other component and they're just going to alternate. So those little areas at the top are going to end up with partial feathers in them and I'm going to leave them until the end and I may not even do them while we're on air um, just because it'll take a bit of time. I'm going to go back after I've quilted a bunch of these feathers and kind of have a feel for it and know what a sort of chopped off feather would look like, that's when I'll go back and put them in there. I often do that with my freehand quilting, by the way. Um, if there's a design that for one reason or another has partial areas that need to be filled in, I'll go ahead and complete all the whole portions and then go back and do those partials after I've got, you know, all that muscle memory in place and I'm super familiar with the design, I find it easier to add later. little closer. There we go. So while I put these lines in, you guys be thinking and give me some feedback. I kind of wish I had done my chevrons with their points upward. Does that make sense? So each pair now that is facing me is pointing down. So I feel like this is the top of the quilt. Does it matter? Should I alternate my feather directions? You know, one row left to right, and then it's totally doesn't matter which is top or bottom. Or should I consider this the top and make all my feathers go that way? So feathers all the same, 
or feathers in alternating directions. Let me know what you think. And I'll quilt these couple of lines in. The little difference of putting that clamp on after I've launched from the left side really helps because now my quilt is not squooshing out ahead of me. That clamp is holding it securely behind me and I've got something to kind of pull against if that makes sense. So even though I don't have room for my clamping mechanism to be there all the time, that little bit of clamping makes a big difference. And I just experiment with whether to leave my machine on kind of in coast mode when I'm pausing at these corners or whether to actually stop when you see that extra, actual little bob of my needle. That's when I'm actually stopping. That's totally personal preference, but I find that if I'm really moving my body and shifting my ruler, often I get a funny little stitch there if I don't actually park. So Mr. Producer is telling me that all the votes are for alternating rows. And I think that's wisdom because then there's no clear right or wrong. So I'm going to start stitching then from where I am over there on what is my right hand side. So I'm just going to take a moment to put a very subtle um, scallop in these feathers. And that's going to be the understood spine. And then I'm going to quilt spineless feathers, which you'll see. And if you've never met spineless feathers before, you're in for a treat. Do I need more scallop than that? Yeah, I do. This is going to look a bit like a scribble, but it's okay. I do want the ones that are in the actual angle to be a nice smooth curve and not be asymmetrical. I want them as symmetrical as I can. Okay, we are going to wing it for these feathers. That's kind of appropriate for feathers, isn't it? Let's see how this works with no clamp on the side. I just don't even know, but we're going to try it.
I do love a feather. I don't think I've ever met a feather I didn't like. You could certainly quilt these feathers without that additional little kind of spine inside each individual plume. But I had pre-decided for the purposes of this quilt that I liked that little additional detail. Entirely personal preference. go a lot faster without it, and that's a fact. stop a second and take my clamp off if my ruler runs into that that's going to make a very square cornered feather so I don't want to risk that just going to make my feathers look like they're extending right off the edge of the quilt. And certainly another option would be to end them with some type of, you know, on purpose, small plume or ending. Again, personal preference. It's my choice to make it look like it just continues right off the edge of the quilt. All right, what do you guys think? Shall I move Lucy so we can see? 
That would be a great idea, wouldn't it? My long arm's name is Lucy, by the way. Lucy is a 26 inch Gamel machine. She does have the elevate capability, which is why you're seeing a tablet, but I don't use it very often. I'm a freehander at heart. Okay, which camera am I on, hon? This one, you right there. Okay, how's it looking, guys? It's quite pretty, isn't it? It's all going to be about texture. And then, of course, you'll get that smashing surprise when you turn it over and look at the backing. So next step is to mark the next section. Uh, sure, let's take some questions, actually. Mr. Producer is asking. My cat, by the way, is right at my feet. I'm having to step over him now to get my coffee in hand. Let's have a sip and some questions. Sandra, I can follow a panto. However, when working from the front, do I look at the needle or where the foot is or what? Great question, Sandra. For me, I hardly ever look at the needle or the foot. My eye is always ahead of where I'm going. And what I'm quilting makes that a bit different. In the case of these feathers, I'm probably only, you know, two or three inches ahead. But when I'm at the point of the feather, I'm already looking at the end where I want to go. And my needle follows my eye and you get way smoother lines if you look out in front. Hope that makes sense. Julianne, how wide is the chevron spacing for the feather? This is five and a half inches from top to bottom, the feather stripe. Debbie, did you make the clamps on the sides? Um, do you mean the little orange ones? If that's what you mean, no, they came with my machine. And they're just a Velcro non-stretchy with a single clamp at the end. Paula, what mode are you stitching on your gamel? For the feather, I was in the regulated mode. For the up and down parallel lines that I was doing, I was in the constant speed mode. Vicki, I love watching you quilt and explain as you're doing it. You remind me of a younger version of my mom, so I feel like I've been taught by the same woman who taught me how to sew. That's a really nice compliment. Also, I'm glad I'm a younger version. Just saying. I'm somebody's grandma, but it's nice to be younger than, <laughs> than others. Debbie, tell me a quilt about the quilt behind you, please. Well, I will for just a second. Double wedding ring, obviously. Um, last week's YouTube episode, which I think was April 6th, um, I talked about it in more depth. So if you want more details, go and look at that one and, and you'll see some pictures of kind of before and after. It was a challenge in my Machine Quilting Guild. I received a rather stained, quite dingy, 75-year-old quilt top and had the lovely task of finishing it. Her name is Audrey and she is my favorite. Just saying. <laughs> Maureen, stunning as always, do you think the heavy quilting will make the quilt hard? No, I don't think so, Maureen. Um, one of the choices is batting will keep it soft. Um, and it's not super heavy quilting in the scheme of things. It's not like quilting pebbles or doing a lot of backtracking. And it's one of the reasons that I chose a spineless feather to keep um, just the, the buildup of thread down a bit. And I think it will still remain soft. Trish, what are you doing for Mother's Day? My kids are taking me out for a brunch tomorrow. That's what I'm doing. What are you doing for Mother's Day? Let me know what you guys are doing. One last sip of my now not even lukewarm coffee. And we're back at it. Okay, so next step is marking. So basically, we're just going to alternate those two stripes that I've done. The, the set of three, the feather. The set of three and the feather. And that's it. That's the whole thing. How to get my ruler the right way. And this is where my pre-marked little lines just come in so handy. At every vertical point, I can just drop those in. And because they're black and vivid on my ruler, it's the easiest thing imaginable. And again, I can see my vertical lines. They're just very simple fold pressure points, but I can see them here. And so that's what enables me to have my, my chevron points will all fall on those lines. And I always post pictures after the fact. So you can always um, check on my social media in a couple days time and I'll have some more detailed photos. It can be difficult, I know, to see on screen, but I'll do some close ups. Um, so you can see the whole pattern. And the gorgeous backing. I'm starting to second guess myself for giving it away. But you know what? There's joy in that too. It's all good. Okay, Dave says there's a question I want to answer before I go on. 
Linda, do you ever travel slash teach in Texas? Well, I haven't ever, but that's not to say I couldn't. Um, I love traveling, but of course there's cost involved in that. But I would happily do Zoom classes. I would happily do like live and unscripted like this for a guild or a group. Yeah, reach out to me. You can email info at stitchedbysusan.com and we can have a chat. I need to advance the quilt a bit because my next level of quilting will be quite a bit forward. Let's see how far we need to go. That should about do it. I'm going to keep this chevron closer to me. Much easier to quilt. Not at arm's length, wouldn't you say? And again, every time I advance every quilt, you saw me do that little tug and I didn't talk about it. I'm grabbing batting at all and making sure that it's all snug, that there's no ripples forming under there and really smoothing down the fabric. And again, if I had piecing, I'd be looking at those lines along my front rails. I don't have piecing today, but I can kind of gauge even by the fall of the fabric that's down here, that it's hanging smooth and straight and it's not pulling up in the middle or sagging in the middle. I'm always making those adjustments and thinking about them while I'm quilting. Um, actually, I'm not gonna extend the basting lines till I do the next advance. They'll be just fine for this one. I'll just put a pin or two in the edge just to make sure. And then when I next do a partial advance, I'll be able to make nice long basting seams. So let's put our magnets back on. Let's do one quick swish of the few little black hairs that are on there from the kitty. There we go. And we're all set. Okay, I'm just taking a minute to look and think to make sure I'm quilting the right lines in the right places. Yep, that looks good. Far easier to take a second to double check and think through than to undo, isn't it? You'll notice I didn't draw my lines in fully. I just dropped the dots. I'm just trying this out. If it looks accurate enough when I do it this way, obviously that saves me a considerable amount of marking time. I felt like it was good to draw it the first time so that I had a very visual guide for what I was doing, but this time I'm gonna try and wing it. I think that when I did this design years ago on that early quilt, I think that was the first ruler work that I ever did. And it was by no means perfect, but I was so pleased with it when the quilt was finished. So I encourage you, give it a try. This is not terribly threatening ruler work. It really isn't. You're not actually stitching in any ditches. Um, it's a good way to practice and get the feel for using a ruler. The original quilt I did it on was kind of abstract, scrappy, but it was constructed in columns. So each column had um, multiple white on white fabrics and then Throughout, it had blocks of colored fabrics and they were very randomly placed throughout, but you piece the whole thing in columns. So then the vertical lines were established even for the quilting. So it was kind of ingenious. The pattern was in a magazine. Uh, I'm thinking American Patchwork and Quilting, but it's been so many years and I did go and look for it so I could tell you guys and give them proper credit, but I could not find it. So I am sorry about that.
can't see my dot. Hang on a sec. That cannot be right. Let me just do a quick measure, second check here. That's because there's two dots. One had just about fully disappeared. If you haven't done ruler work before, probably the most difficult thing to learn about doing it is, is remembering that you've got the width of your hopper foot in place. So when I'm placing my ruler dot to dot, I'm actually placing my ruler a quarter inch away from the dot. So that's something you always have to keep in mind and learn to gauge. And funny story, in the years that I've been long arming are the same years that my eyes were kind of aging and I had to start wearing cheaters. And it took getting used to all over again when I had, you know, magnification in my glasses, that eyeballing of that spacing really took getting used to. Hang on, button on my shirt caught on the magnet. <laughs> Sorry about that, I had to pause. A little bit of a wobble there, not too bad. In order to remedy that, I'm just gonna scooch my magnets so they're way around, almost at the bottom of my rails. There we go. I'm gonna change my order of stitching this time because I like doing those little up and down lines from left to right, I'm just more comfortable that way. It doesn't matter what order, obviously, you stitch these stripes in. I'm gonna do some more experimenting. You guys get to watch. I'm gonna see how I do with using a ruler on this. So I've got it back on regulate so I can control the speed. I just wanna see how this works to stitch and do those bottom edges and use a ruler. I'm a lot slower and that's a fact. Okay, nice try. But no, back to our constant speed and freehanding it. I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so I'm a little bit bothered at how imperfect these lines actually are, but I think I'm gonna talk myself into just leaving it alone. I think the texture and the look of these stripes when it's all said and done will be just fine. I just need to get over myself.
An interesting little side note. This is my second long arm, and my first one was similar. It was just an older model. It was the same brand, um, had a few less features. But one thing that it did better was this type of parallel line quilting. Um, this is one of my favorite things to quilt, actually, is these little matchstick lines. But this machine is not as good about staying in a straight line. My older machine, I could kind of just give it a shove in the right direction. And unless I moved it, it would do a nice straight line. This one, I more have to guide. Just interesting little piece of trivia. Each machine has its own little idiosyncrasies. Why am I cutting thread? What are you doing, girl? Let's just pull that loop to the top, anchor it again, and keep going on. And all those threads will get trimmed when I trim off the edges of the quilt, obviously. And there we are. Let's just stitch down here a little bit and now we'll go ahead and do our larger advance and do some more basting. So this is not a huge quilt. I tried to keep it in proportion to the width, which as you saw was with the fabric. Um, so I have a yard and a quarter of fabric, which is what, 45 inches? That's probably too far. I'm just thinking out loud here, folks. That is, I don't want to quilt at arm's length. I'm so used to, you know, in each advance, being efficient, rolling it forward. But no, in fact, I don't want to quilt at arm's length. That'll be perfect. I need to raise my quilt a bit. One thing about the red snappers is they, they're kind of thick, so I often have to adjust my, the roller that's holding my quilt, I often adjust that up and down as I work, because when the red snapper is down, it's really tightly against, against Lucy underneath, and then when the red snapper bar is up, then I can lower my rail a little bit. This is kind of cheater basting because I actually have my little fold line actually drawn on the quilt. Just follow the line, perfect. Let me just get this other basting line in place and then I'll grab me another sip of coffee and answer you guys' questions and comments. I did not pre-measure how many chevrons would end up on the quilt. To me, that doesn't matter at all. Just when they run out, I'm just gonna make it look like they continued on off the edge. So I've been calling this a small whole cloth quilt. Is there another term for it that you all know of that I could be calling it instead? I feel like that's what it is. It's just one whole piece of cloth, but it doesn't have a you know, medallion type design like so many do. Okay, let me get my cup in hand and let's take some questions. Yeah, because I have to look up to see the questions, hon. I'm looking at a monitor that's like right here with a camera beside it. So it works really well when we have questions. Susan, do you have a roller base on your machine? 
I'm not sure what you mean by a roller base. So maybe, do you mean wheels on the legs of my machine? So maybe clarify that and I'll try and answer it for you, Susan. Paula, on my gamble, my front belly bar rolls. Is yours stationary? I must lean up close. Even with magnet, it rolls. Mine does roll, but I don't usually find that to be a problem because my quilt is just rolling over the top of it as I use it. So I'm not quite sure how that is a problem for you. Paula Ferry. Susan, perhaps you've mentioned in the past, I love my black magnets, but once was holding one in each hand, got them too close, and I couldn't stop them from catching a couple fingers. Um, have I ever done that? I don't think so. I've dropped them on my toe, and that was painful too. I don't know, Paula. I know they're strong magnets. They really, really are. One lady mentioned that she actually cut her finger on one it pinched so badly. So I'm sorry. Maybe I should put a warning about these magnets. They're very strong. Debbie, hey, Dave. Get the lady a hot cup of coffee. Hee, hee, hee. Thanks, Debbie, for that. Appreciate it. <laughs> and that's it. Honestly, it's not so much about the coffee. It's just about wetting my whistle a little bit from talking. Is really all it's about, folks. Okay, glasses back on. What's next? So we've done the three stripes, so feathers are next. One, two, three, four, five, and a half. Make sure I get the right line for the feathers. I keep second guessing myself. I was right, but I keep second guessing myself. Dave says that Sue Tap is kindly reminding me to start my feathers from the opposite end. So thanks for that. Because honestly, those are the sorts of things that I'm, you know, I'm talking, <laughs> I'm percolating, and I forget to actually do. Uh, we'll do that, and I think we'll go ahead and do the quarter inch one below that as well. Get those two in place. I probably could have eyeballed a quarter inch one, but here we are, using a ruler. And I think it worked pretty well to just quilt from dot to dot on that last sequence. So I will do that again and save the time of actually fully marking in all the lines. This ruler, by the way, is made by the A1 brand of quilting machine. Um, I do not think it is in my product links. I'll have to add it in there. I purchased mine from Green Fairy Quilts, but I'm sure it can be purchased from A1 quilting machines as well. And I, it is my favorite straight ruler. First one I ever bought. Um, don't think I've ever bought another straight one. Some of the rulers I have for other purposes have one straight edge on them, but this is my favorite go-to and mostly because of the handle that's on it. I feel like that's a really critical part of a good ruler is having some type of gripper on it so that you can hang on to it in different ways with your finger and your hand as opposed to just having to put downward pressure on it. So I fell in love with this one and I've just never gone any further. That's a very big quarter inch there. I fudged that corner just a little bit. A 
Okay, starting the feather from the other side. I remembered. Let's take the clamp off so we don't hit that. It's one of the downsides of the ruler base. I mean, you have to use it when you're stitching with the ruler, but because it's so wide, you really, it, it's always bumping into your clamps and things at the side. So having the yardstick helps. Um, having extra backing is the best possible solution. But I just don't have that option today. What did I do with my marker, folks? Did you see where I put it? There it is. Right at the front rail. Again, I'm just drawing my suggestion of a spine in here. Just shifting my clamp. I just do not want to hit it and put a square corner on my beautiful feathers. Just looking at my shape and kind of reevaluating. I think we're good. I know I probably look very hunched over these feathers and very tense, but something I really work at when I'm quilting, especially on close concentrated things like this, is relaxing on purpose. So if you watch my hands, my fingers are loose enough that I can actually waggle them on my handlebars. My head is loose enough that I can actually, you know, turn my neck a little bit. What you don't want to do is hold your muscles tight and tense. Because it's a few minutes going across this quilt, and that is not, not good for your neck and shoulders. So work on relaxing. And the best way to know if you're doing that is by moving things around. Can I move my fingers? Can I move my head? And look, I was talking and forgot that one spine. Let's put it back in there. There we go.
Somebody remind me at the end of this pass to pop my bobbin out and check its levels. I would not like to run out of bobbin thread in the middle of one long line of ruler work. Those of you who watch off and I know my usual method is to just keep quilting till it runs out and then change and do a little lock stitch. Not as easy when you're doing ruler work. That really shows in a long straight line of quilting. So when I'm nearing the end of my bobbin, I'll just put a fresh one in. Stop, Lucy. There we go. Perfect. One more row of feathers done. Okay, let's check that bobbin. Oh, actually, there's still a fair bit in there. I'll quilt all the straight lines. So there's your next assignment. Remind me after I get this next set of lines quilted before I do the fills to check my bobbin thread again. Okay, great time for questions and comments. I will quickly get my next set of lines marked on here and then we'll chat. definitely saves time not to mark all these lines. A lot of time. What are you guys thinking of this design? Something you think you might try? I mean, obviously it's very easily customizable. You could do entirely different things in the lines if you wish. Whatever suits your fancy. who's a cat lover like me, he is laying off to my left, just at the end of the long arm, sound asleep. Just gotta be in the room where all the stuff's happening. Whoops, you guys, that's not where a quarter inch echo line is supposed to be. I don't know why I had that in my mind's eye, but I did. Good thing I wasn't very far. This is what undoing looks like, going backwards. Sometimes when you undo on a solid color, often, the needle holes really show. Um, couple ways to get rid of that. One is a soft bristle brush and brush, brush briskly across it because it's not really holes, right? It's just where um, the, the fibers have been pushed apart. So you're just brushing them and making them go back closed. And if that doesn't do it, a little spritz of moisture and brushing will do it. 
and all those holes will close up nicely. I will probably not take the time to do that right now. I'll do it after I'm finished quilting. All those holes will close up nicely. A little bit of brushing and effort on my behalf. Someone's reminding me to check my bobbin. Keep that thought in mind. I just want to finish all these lines that are all together from left to right. Before I do, I'm sure I have enough for that. And then I will change it out. That's what I was afraid of. You guys, better safe than sorry. I looked at the point I was aiming to and I thought, I don't know if I can reach that. I'm going to bump that front rail. And then I thought, no, it'll be okay. But no, I did bump the rail. And of course, that really shows in a straight line. So once again, I'm undoing and I will advance the quilt just a little bit. Just need another half inch. live and unscripted right this is what quilting actually looks like in my studio you know if I was doing a curvy design and on a printed fabric and there was a little bobble chances are I would not undo it but when you're doing straight line quilting things are much more visible aren't they and on a solid and also it was just a few inches so it's all good Move the magnets a bit, advance the quilt a bit. And we're back in business. So while I do this next line or two, you guys chime in. Time has been flying while we're having fun. Dave is telling me we're at two hours already, which is fairly long. So, would you guys like me to keep going and finish the quilt? There is certainly another hour in it. Or have you kind of seen enough and um, we can close up shop and I can just show you the photographs of the finished project when it's done. Let me know what you think. One, two, three. This is supposed to be a quarter inch line. Here we go. And after this line, that's when I want to change the bobbin.
and I'll be 100% honest with you, my quarter inch spacing is not absolutely perfect when I'm eyeballing like this from dot to dot. If I wanted it to be really precise, I would draw the lines, especially for those quarter inches. When the line is actually drawn and you kind of have that to refer to for your stitching, it's sorry about that. It's um, much easier to get it really precise. If you look closely at this, you know, some of them are a thread or two over a quarter inch and some are a thread or two under a quarter inch in their spacing. I'm not sweating it for the purposes of this quilt, but that's what I would do if I wanted it more precise. I would draw them in. Okay, changing out that bobbin. I knew today's project would take two or three, so I had them wound and ready to go. I have the same thread in the bottom that I have on the top. Again, because I like doing those little fill lines left to right, I'm just going to travel and put this other wavy line in first, and then I'll be all set up for the other one. If you decide to do a design similar to this and you want to do something different in these stripes, one of the things to consider, I think, is that you alternate something that flattens like those little lines do with something that stays quite fluffy like this one does. That's what really accentuates the stripe effect. I'm honestly quite struggling with these little lines. Lucy feels very wobbly today. Usually my answer when that happens is to pull out my air compressor and give a really thorough clean to all the rails and wheels. Make sure there's no thread or lint hanging around. Except I just did that yesterday, so I'm not sure what today's problem is, but that's what I'll do after I'm done quilting today, is I'll go on the hunt again for anywhere that there could be some residue that's just making her pull a little bit, and you just feel it on these straight little lines.
While I finish this mindless bit of quilting, I will let you know a couple other things that are on the horizon. Um, I offer a really comprehensive freehand quilting masterclass, which is an online course. Six modules, lots of lessons, 30 plus designs, etc. And I am soon going to be launching another round of that. It's going to be beginning in June, but leading up to it, I got some workshops and free content and things going on. So if you're not already signed up for my newsletter, you might want to do that. There is a link in the show notes if you're watching this live. If you're watching it later, by the magic of editing, we'll have a little button up in the upper right hand corner of the screen that gives you a link. And my newsletters will be giving information, dates, details of those various things coming up. All right. What are our folks saying, Dave, about staying going or calling it a day? Apparently Debbie is laughing at me and saying that my spacing is getting bigger. I must be tired and hurrying. You can see the end of the quilt though. Like we are, we are getting there. So I think um, over 60% say they want to keep going. What did you say? 64 say keep going. 35 say let's take a break or stop. And 1% and is lost. <laughs> I'm guessing Google is just rounding the numbers. That's what I'm guessing. Oh, a couple of questions. Let me just get the last little bit basted here and then we'll take the last few questions. And I, once again, will wet my whistle. I'm quite liking having this little straight line drawn on the side of my quilt, this little crease. It's a beautiful thing for knowing exactly where to quilt my basting line. And once again, I've got to forward about a half inch more. Actually, with that kind of winging it way that I was trimming the bottom edge of the batting, I cut about a quarter inch off on this side. So you know what? My quilt is going to be about an inch shorter. So what I'm doing is I've just put my horizontal channel lock on and I'm just going to stitch a straight line across the bottom. And that will be the end of my quilt. And it looks like the fabric was not cut perfectly straight anyway. So that was a good decision because look, now we're at a quarter inch. Where's my little fold? There it is. Perfect. So that is the end, folks, right there. I'm just going to lower the quilt when you see it bobbling under my hopper foot. That's because it's too high. There we go. Okay. So everybody who does want me to continue, well, let's go at it the other way. Those who are tired of this quilting design are welcome to go and have their lunch or dinner or whatever it is that there is next in their day. But those who want to continue, would you give us a thumbs up um, in the chat window? That keeps interaction going and feel free to share as well. There is certainly still time for folks to join in and ask a few questions. I'll be doing one more whole repeat plus a bit, it looks like. All right, do we have some questions or comments? Should I move Lucy to the other side? That's often easier, isn't it? Okay. And I'm seeing something else. Just gotta fix what I'm seeing. There we go. Eileen, what do you do with your leftover bobbins when you still have some thread on them at the end of a row of ruler work? I use them to baste or for piecing. 
Um, I typically don't use them for piecing just because they're 100% poly and I don't know why, I certainly could. I do sometimes use them for um, binding because I do quite a bit of binding for my clients and it's 100% machine binding so it ends up being top stitched on the top. I use them for that. Um, I use them when I'm quilting samples sometimes, various ways. But in this case, there wasn't all that much left. A couple yards, maybe. It wasn't very much. Paula, thanks, not sure I explained very well. Magnets stay in place, but bar may roll, causing quilt to loosen. That does not happen on mine. Like when my magnets, I see what you're saying. If you shift against the magnets, it could cause it to roll. I, I don't typically find that to be a problem, Paula. Maybe because my back is fixed, like this piece of fabric, because it's attached at both ends. Maybe that helps hold things in place. I don't find a problem with it at any rate. Penny, how large is the quilt that you are doing? Well, it's with the fabric from side to side, so about 44 inches, and I cut it a yard and a quarter. I had it cut at the fabric store, so that would be, what, 45 long. Does Susan need a break? She's been doing all the work. Susan's totally fine, <laughs> but thanks for thinking of me. I am gonna get a sip of coffee. Sip of my very, very cold coffee. I'm giving Dave the side eye. Now all I need is a sip to keep me going. Oh, there's another question, sorry. Uh, Linda, Linda's disappeared, huh? I have a sit down quilting machine, 18 inches. Would the master class help me? You know, Linda, this may be a longer question than I can answer fully. Certainly the designing ideas and methods of traveling around a quilt top and how to make graceful designs, all that stuff would certainly help you. And many of the designs convert well to working at a domestic machine, just maybe on a smaller scale with less sweeping curves. There are a few designs in it that are row based. So um, someone else asked me this actually in an email just earlier today. And I think they would be doable. You would just need more basting or stabilizing of your quilt because when you work from one side to the other, that can be a problem when you're working at a sit down machine. So you'd have to really have it stabilized. But again, feel free to email me, Susan, or sorry, info at stitchedbysusan.com and we could chat further. Charlene, I'm late. Why are you not clamping the edges? Charlene, because I'm using the width of fabric of, of both my quilt top and my backing and there's so little to work with. So I'm just taking extra care not to get any wrinkles in my backing. And I'm sometimes clamping when I'm not sewing near the edges. It's just trying to get the most usable inches out of my top fabric that I can. That's the only reason. Okay, Mr. Producer is clarifying for me. You guys are graciously thumbs upping. Is that a verb? in the chat window, which we appreciate. What he's actually asking for is likes on the video, right? Because right that, that shows it to lots of people. So it's right underneath the stream that you're watching. Just the little, the little handy thumb up, you know, or thumb down if you feel that way. But the thumb up would be really nice. Okay, let's get marking. The next one is going to be the big feather, right? So one, two, three, four, five and a half right there. So for those few who are perhaps just tuning in early on in the process, I showed two really great tools that are so helpful for me. And one is um, a tool that I use to make vertical creases. And I did that before I loaded the quilt so that the points of my chevrons, I don't know that you can see them on camera, probably not, but I can see this very fine fold line for all those creases that I made for all the vertical lines. And the other was the tip for putting markings that stay on my ruler for the whole process. So I don't have to redo that addition every time. I think that tip for marking right on the ruler with a Sharpie, I think that was Beth Ann Nemesh that first told me that. And that was a light bulb moment for me to know that I could make points of reference on my 
any of my rulers, whether cutting or quilting rulers, and it comes right off with rubbing alcohol or with little tiny medical swabs. Last ruler was, or sorry, last, I can't see the last feather and I can't remember which way it went. I've got to look again. Yep, it did go the other way, I was right. Just wanted to be sure. So for my giant feathers, again, for those of you who are just tuning in, I'm alternating the direction of the feathers to keep the quilt from being directional and having a distinct top and bottom. drawing the suggestion of a spine, and I do not ever actually quilt this line. That's the idea of a spineless feather. You don't quilt the actual spine, it's just a visual spine is created as you quilt the feather plumes. This is feeling very wishy-washy without a clamp attached. I'm just gonna stop a time or two and make sure there's no creases happening under there. And as soon as I get far enough away with my ruler plate, I will put a clamp on. I feel like I'm still getting a lot of bobbling. I'm going to lower the quilt another half inch. Hmm. Mr. Producer is saying I'm quilting too close to the roll. I'm sure he's right about that. So let me just back up a little. That should do it. Is that better? If any of you do quilt for other folks, this would be a great video to show them if they wonder why you want so much extra backing fabric when you're doing custom quilting. I'm still too close with my clamp. Um, it would be a great way to show them. This is the problem that results when you don't have enough excess fabric to attach your clamp to, to lay your ruler up against those clamps, all those things, it's just made extra difficult worded another way it's much easier when you have some excess backing on the sides now I'm far enough I can put that clamp on there nice and firmly To check my tension a second. Yeah, it feels good. Just wanted to be sure. All I'm doing is running my fingernail under on the bottom of the quilt on the backing really hard against the stitching line. And if there's any laddering, you would feel that against your nail. It's a quick and quick and dirty way of checking your tension without crawling under the quilt.
Sometimes I get off my drawn spine a little bit and have to fudge it, which I think is totally fine. But I do try and keep my moving back onto it as graceful and gradual as I can. Because the line that is created with your stitches is what you read as the spine. So if it has a eighth inch jog in it, that will kind of show up as the spine. So it's important to keep that curve graceful, even if it doesn't exactly follow what your drawn line was. Set of lines. Hmm. On to the next thing. I have a problem. You can see how very handy these little black marks are. I don't have to do any mental math. You know how it is when you're quilting. You've, you've seen me do it a million times. You know, when you're when you're busy doing things and quilting, it's just all so easy to forget one line or put an extra line in. I mean, I even did that earlier on, even with these markings on here. So it can be really helpful to take that thinking process out every time and just be able to follow the dots. I'm just going to break thread for a second and come all the way to the front to make sure I have enough room. I do. We're golden. So I mentioned early on, but I'll say it again for those who are tuning in or coming in and out. I'm not doing as much talking today because this is a more complex design and I just have to pay attention. Um, so because it's on a nice whole cloth fabric, I feel like you can really see what I'm doing and hopefully you can glean some tips from that and I'm taking time to answer questions as well but sometimes I just have to stay focused on the quilting before I got a joggle in there. Yep, it looks okay. You can easily see how when I don't have a clamp on, it's wanting to push both fabrics and batting the whole thing out in front of me. So as soon as I'm past the point where that clamp will hold, on it goes.
Here's another question for you folks. Since this quilt is being given, and to someone who's not a quilt maker, should I wash it beforehand? Because you know how crisp quilts always are when they're brand, brand new. Um, and I don't want her to like get scared the first time she goes to wash it. And by the way, I'm going to point something out here. Are we looking at, we are looking at it on the close. Do you see how I got a little pleat there at the edge? I've opted to leave that in there because it's going to fall under the binding seam. And in fact, I'm going to pin my next one so that it does the same thing, if that makes sense. Because there is that little bit of extra fullness there. I could have pulled it a little more snug when I was basting. To me, it's not worth taking the stitches out because that is going to fall entirely within my binding seam. So I choose to just manage it and leave it in. We're nearing the end, folks. Early on, I talked about how at the top end of the quilt, there's a portion, a small portion of this chevron um, forming some kind of triangles at the top of unquilted area. And it's where the feather design would fall. So I don't think I'll stay on camera for that one. I'll just go ahead and finish it. But when I post the finished photos, you'll be able to see how that was done. When I can, I like to go ahead and quilt the full motifs first and I really get in the groove of it and get a feel for it. And then when I go back and finish the partial ones, they tend to look better, in my opinion. So I usually just leave that till the end and then go back and add it afterwards. my clamp and I just quilted through it and it did okay.
that's the last one of those. Catch that little fold in there and then it'll be done. There we go. Okay, we're gonna advance a little bit more. Draw the last of the lines in. Um, probably the last good chance to be asking questions, honestly, or typing in questions. And I'll get these lines um, the dots dropped in and then we'll take a second to answer the questions. Something I did not do in the course of this quilt that I probably should have, you guys, but you know, I'm busy talking to you, is I probably should have occasionally dropped a yardstick or a piece of painter's tape across to make sure that my points were at the same level because each one I'm just measuring from the one before, if that makes sense. Which camera am I on, hon? This one. <laughs> Look at you guys. Um, and so there's that possibility for them shifting a bit. And in fact, they have. So when I'm dropping my lines here, I realize this one point is about five eighths of an inch lower than this one and this one. As it happens, I don't think that's too awful. I'm just going to fly with it. I want this edge to be straight. Um, it's in my feather, so I don't think it's going to be very visible. You know, if I had an exact point happening there and the points were very different, I might have actually shortened my quilt so that that would not be so obvious. Does that make sense? But I think because of the feathers, I'll be able to get away with it. That's my plan anyways. You know, you do still learn something as you do every quilt and each one is generally a little bit different than another one. You don't do the same thing exactly twice. So, you know, note to self, that's something for next time that I should do when I'm doing this type of chevron design is every so often double check that the chevrons are still lined up well. Oh, someone's reminding me to mark the last one. See, good job, you guys. I could not do this without you, seriously. Would have noticed when I got there, but it's a lot easier to do it in advance, isn't it? It is hard. I'll just be honest about it. It is hard to talk and do this at the same time and not, you know, do that very thing. Just forget exactly what you're in the middle of. And I am not the world's best multitasker at the best of times, so. It's really good that I have you all to remind me. Funny how sometimes the quilt seems to really pull and distort when I don't have the clamp on and sometimes it's not so bad. I don't know what makes the difference quite honestly. Maybe it's because of that basting stitch across the bottom. I don't know. You can see here with this point, this is the one that's closer now to the bottom of the quilt. I 
That side really pulls goofy. I've just got to mark this line because I don't have a point for the bottom of it. And I need one. Even though it goes off my quilting area, I just need to know where, where to join up. Just right there. You know what, guys? Do you see what I just did? Next row. Oh boy. Let's start a conversation and perhaps put on a pot of coffee. No, no, the next thing is feather. I'm, qu I'm quilting and I'm thinking while I'm doing it, I've been telling all these folks that I'm quilting the feather across this bottom point and here I am quilting points. What am I doing? What am I doing? That is the million dollar question. Okay. Um, what should we do, hon? Well, I'm just wondering, honestly, if we should stay on air and do this. I guess we will. You, this is live and unscripted, right? You guys get to see the, the real deal. And Dave's going to be a sweetheart and go actually fill my coffee for me with a fresh, fresh cup. So that will be a nice thing. We've been on so long that the batteries on the iPhone cameras are dying, by the way. <laughs> we don't do them this long very often. And I'm happy to take your feedback, you know, both on the length and also even on the type of project. Um, so often my projects are more freehand edge to edge designs, but they're often dictated by, you know, being customer projects. And so whatever things are coming in, those are my options. Um, this one is my own project. And I, as soon as I thought of it, I thought that will be a really fun one to do with my YouTube friends because it's just a little bit different. Um, from what I usually do and also a little bit different from what whole cloth quilts typically are. And it is honestly an awesome way to make a gift quilt. Is have a really smashing backing and a solid on the front. Um, some months back, quite a few months back, I was doing the prep. I don't even think my master class was yet written. It was still just a gleam in my eye. But I was kind of pulling together ideas and samples and things like that. Anyway, I made a whole quilt. I was working on designs that were um, kind of handwriting based, so therefore in rows. And you know, they had kind of C, was kind of as their. I actually made a whole quilt in that way. It's like a striped quilt, but the stripes are only different quilted things some bigger, some smaller, some more ornate. And it was really fun, actually, a really fun um, project. And I, I was able to put a lot of quilting skills to use in that. It was really fun. While Mr. Producer is off getting my coffee, I can't even take any comments. So this area of conversation is all one-sided. It's just me talking. be faster methods for undoing them. I've never been really, really good at going backwards with my stitching. Certainly there are methods where you can just cut the top thread every so often, and I've tried it, and it's fairly speedy, but then the process of picking all those little threads off is really grim. So I always come back to it this way. But when Mr. Producer gets back and you can give me some comments, I'd love to hear if you've got some great ideas for an effective way to undo stitching. Because sometimes it just happens one way and another. Hot coffee, dear. My hot coffee has arrived. Wonderful. At the end of this row, I'll stop and take a sip and see if you guys have chimed in on undoing methods or commiserations or, you know, anything like that.
I might as well show you the other method while I'm here. If you, if you have a fairly long strand already on the top and you put a lot of tension on it, like almost to the breaking point, and then just snip your top thread every so often, it is faster for undoing. There's no doubt about it. But then you have to go back and pick all the little bits. Because the bottom thread then is cut into these little slices. So I am not convinced that that is faster in the long run. My opinion. Everyone's entitled to my opinion, right? This would be a great time, actually, <laughs> to tell me some of your undoing horror stories. You know, have you ever had to undo a whole pass or worse yet, a whole quilt? I mean, I don't feel like that would happen very often because you would see the horrible tension as you were rolling it up. But, you know, I'd love to know if it's happened and how you made the best of it. Or did you just wad the quilt up and call it a day? Okay, I'm going to stop for a sip and to get you guys' comments. All right, do we have some comments? Okay. I'm thinking what we'll do is take these comments and a few closing remarks from me because this is like a 10 or 15 minute job to undo. So I think we'll call it a day at that point. But let's go ahead and chat for a few minutes with your comments and we'll go from there. Okay, Mindy, I would wash it. Then they know they won't mess it up when they wash it. Also, when you wash it, it becomes more cuddly. I completely agree. And it also makes sure that all the marking pen is out of it. You know, all those things. I do, by the way, have little labels that I sew into my binding and they just say, wash warm, dry low. So super simple washing instructions, but I do want people to know, yeah, that they can wash it without hurting it. But that first wash can be startling. <laughs> Susan, sometimes I give a small index card with washing instructions along with my gift. That's a really great idea. I like that idea. For the feathers, Sue, why wouldn't you just complete the feather on the ends instead of cutting them off at the seam line? Absolutely an option, Sue. Absolutely. Just personal preference, that's all. Susie King, I'm going to do this as a Christmas quilt. A beautiful backing with the top in white or cream using variegated thread and Christmas colors. Thanks for the inspiration. I hope you post pictures on social media and tag me with them. I would really, really love to see that. I think that sounds like a really beautiful thing. Tree skirts? I mean, you could do a lot of fun Christmas things that way. Jody, I'm feeling much better about myself and my long arm quilting today. Thank you because I'm having such a hard time <laughs> or because you're inspired. <laughs> Either way, it's all good. Uh, Jody, thanks for showing us all the real. I always imagine that I'm the lonely, the only long arm person who has the hiccups that you're allowing us to see. No, you absolutely aren't. And that is part of the beauty of sharing the way that I do. This is what it looks like in my studio. I don't honestly know what anybody else's looks like, but this is what mine looks like. Don't know the name, but anyway, yes to all. The project, the length, I'm at work and can't watch it all now, but I will eventually. And for sure, thanks for showing how you deal with the oopsies. Absolutely. Mindy, do you have an online class for beginners? My mother-in-law has a quilting machine I can use anytime, but I don't know what or how to quilt designs. Um, Mindy, I wouldn't say my class is ultra beginner because I don't talk through things like um, actually loading the quilt or actually, you know, doing bob and tension and things like that. That is percolating in the back of my mind. However, the designs that are in it, at least some of them, there is a selection that every beginner can do and they build and the skill level builds. And also because it's always available to you, you can circle back around. If, even if you only pick up three designs the first time through, you can come back as your skill level advances. So again, feel free to email me if you want to chat further. Info at 
stitchedbysusan.com. Gail, I'm a new long armor wondering what quilting design you'd suggest to practice curves. Um, there's a few of them, but most of the easiest ones have to do with loops. And honestly, there's a lot of things and even variety that you can do with loops, adding drop-ins, changing the scale and size and how they fit together. But loops are a great way and practice making chubby round loops. Tiffany's Quilting Life. I did wood grain, a whole row, and it had bad tension just randomly. It was heavy quilting too. Took my hubs and I six days to unpick it all. Oh, that makes my heart hurt. And sadly, that does happen. Like, if a bobbin's not wound quite right, you can check your tension till you're blue in the face and it's perfect. And then somewhere randomly in the middle, it's all shot. Anitra. For the first two years I owned my new long arm, I ripped half of every bobbin out of my quilts. I calculated one of my quilts took me 17 hours to rip out the stitches. Ouch! I hope you figured out sort of what was at the root of it eventually. Gail, could you review the measurements of each row? Honestly, Gail, well, I guess I've got them on my ruler here. The big lines are an inch and three quarters apart. And then every so often I had the little quarter inch spacing to have that little echo. And then the feathers are five and a half. That's very general, but that should help you. Tiffany again, do your clients prefer you to do what you think is best for their quilts or do they give you direction on what they want or do they prefer computerized edge to edge? Very few of my clients do computerized edge to edge because that's not my skill set. So I, although I do have one, there's a lot to learn in that in terms of, you know, nesting different designs and things. And that's not my area of expertise. And as to whether I choose or they, that totally varies. I ask each one, especially when they're a new client, because some of them do have quite specific ideas and will sit and confer. I always want input because I'm the one quilting it. But some do have really good ideas and some just say, make it beautiful, do whatever you want. And I'm good either way. Yvonne, I have a large quilt I had custom long arm. They did a terrible job. I need to take a lot of it out. Any recommendations? That is so sad. It always, yeah. Dave is saying a big, big, big glass of wine, possibly a jug. <laughs> because, and Netflix, because there's no fast way to do it. Um, it's probably easier with it on your lap. I will say, Whichever side the tension is pulling on, like where you're seeing the straight line of thread, that's the side to undo on. It will be way faster to pick than from the side where the stitches are going down through. Does that make sense? So that might help a little bit. And I'm very sorry. That always makes me sad when a fellow long arm, you know, colleague does a poor job on a client's quilt. I'm sorry to hear that. Mindy, I ripped a hole in my fabric taking out a line of quilting. I then had to do some applique throughout the quilt to hide it. I have done that too. That's probably another story for another day. I was quilting a show quilt one time on constant speed and the needle broke and just powered a hole right through all the layers. Oh my goodness, disaster. Anyway, and there I told you the story anyways. But there are fixes and it sounds like you've, you've hit on one. Do some applique and then, you know, make it a design decision throughout the quilt. So that's very good. But I think for today's purposes, because by the time I unpick this and restitch it, we're going to be three quarters of an hour and that's feeling really, really long. So we're going to call her quits for today. A few reminders of where, where else you can find me. If you're interested in other things, I do have a podcast. It's called Measure Twice, Cut Once. And you can find it at podcast.stitchbysusan.com. And from there, you can choose the favorite app of your choice. I would be thrilled to pieces if you would leave reviews and comments on that. It really helps to sort of spread the word. So those are all interview based with other quilters, some that are professional and do it as a career, some just people that have a great story that I thought would appeal. Um, also, if you wish to, to um, support this channel, buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitch by Susan is a great way to support with as little as $5. Like and subscribe, share the heck out of this episode. This is my style of quilting and I do love to help other quilters get comfortable and confident in their quilting. Anything else, Mr. Producer, that I have forgotten? Okay, apparently there are still a couple more comments. Let's have them. Let's do it. Tina, any advice when using variegated thread? Uh, what, what kind of advice are you thinking? Like in terms of tension or what thread to pick? So we'll circle back around to that one. Clarify a bit for me if you would. 
Anitra, it was a combination of things. My wonder was problematic. My bobbin spring was set too high and I had a poor winding technique. My hair is finally growing back in. I'm so glad to hear that. But it is true that the winding of your bobbin smoothly and evenly is absolutely critical. $100 spent on a bobbin winder is probably a really good investment. Cindy E, thank you so much for your time teaching. You are welcome. It's my pleasure, truly. Okay, folks, let's leave it at that. We'll wrap up today's show. Again, this has been a small whole cloth quilt with some fun feathers and chevron shaped designs with a couple tips in for surprising tools like marking on your rulers with Sharpie pens. So if you've missed those at the beginning, you'll want to go back and have a look at them. A couple, I think, kind of surprising tips. So I'm always here trying to offer practical um, support and tips and just showing you what quilting looks like in my studio. These episodes are called Live and Unscripted and we are on YouTube the first and third Fridays.